St. Augustine's Confessions, Book 1, Number 1. Can any praise be worthy of the Lord's majesty? How magnificent his strength, how inscrutable his wisdom. Man is one of your creatures, Lord, and his instinct is to praise you. He bears about him the mark of death, the sign of his own sin, to remind him that you thought the proud. But still, since he is a part of your creation, he wishes to praise you. The thought of you stirs him so deeply that he cannot be content unless he praises you, because you made us for yourself, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. Grant me, Lord, to know and understand whether a man is first to pray to you for help or to praise you, and whether he must know you before he can call you to his aid. If he does not know you, how can he pray to you? For he may call for some other help, mistaking it for yours. Or are men to pray to you and learn to know you through their prayers? Only how are they to call upon the Lord until they have learned to believe in him? And how are they to believe in him without a preacher to listen to? Those who look for the Lord will cry out in praise of him. Because all who look for him shall find him. And when they find him, they will praise him. I shall look for you, Lord, by praying to you. And as I pray, I shall believe in you. Because we have had preachers to tell us about you. It is my faith that calls to you, Lord, the faith which you gave me and made to live in me through the merits of your Son, who became man, and through the ministry of your preacher. Confessions 2 How shall I call upon my God for aid? when the call I make is for my Lord and my God to come into myself. What place is there in me to which my God can come? What place that can receive the God who made heaven and earth? Does this then mean, O Lord my God, that there is in me something fit to contain you? Can even heaven and earth, which you made and in which you made me, contain you? For since nothing that exists could exist without you, this is mean that whatever exists does, in this sense, contain you. If this is so, since I too exist, why do I ask you to come into me? For I should not be there at all unless in this way you were already present within me. I am not in hell, and yet you are there too. For if I sink down to the world beneath, you are present still. So then I should be null and void and could not exist at all if you, my God, were not in me. Or is it rather that I should not exist unless I existed in you? For all things find in you their origin, their impulse, the centre of their being. This, Lord, is the true answer to my question. But if I exist in you, how can I call upon you to come to me? And where would you come from? For you, my God, have said that you fill heaven and earth. But I cannot go beyond the bounds of heaven and earth so that you may leave them to come to me. Confessions number three. Do heaven and earth then contain the whole of you, since you fill them? Or when once you have filled them, is some part of you left over, because they are too small to hold you? If this is so, when you have filled heaven and earth, does that part of you which remains flow over into some other place? Or is it that you have no need to be contained in anything, because you contain all things in yourself, and fill them by reason of the very fact that you contain them? 
for the things which you fill by containing them do not sustain and support you as a water vessel supports the liquid which fills in. Even if they were broken to pieces, you would not flow out of them in a way. And when you pour yourself out over us, you are not drawn down to us, but draw us up to yourself. You are not scattered away, but you gather us together. You fill all things, but do you fill them with your whole self? Or is it that the whole of creation is too small to hold you and therefore holds only a part of you? And is this same part of you present in all things at once? Or do different things contain different parts of you, greater or smaller, according to their size? Does this mean that one part of you is greater and another smaller? Or are you present entirely everywhere at once, and no single thing contains the whole of you? Confessions number four. What then is the God I worship? He can be none but the Lord God himself, for who but the Lord is God? What other refuge can there be except our God? You, my God, are supreme, utmost in goodness, mightiest and all-powerful, most merciful and most just. You are the most hidden from us and yet the most present amongst us, the most beautiful and yet the most strong, ever enduring and yet we cannot comprehend you. You are unchangeable and yet you change all things. You are never new, never old, and yet all things have new life from you. You are the unseen power that brings decline upon the proud. You are ever active, yet always at rest. You gather all things to yourself, though you suffer no need. You support, you fill, and you protect all things. You create them, nourish them, and bring them to perfection. You seek to make them your own, though you lack for nothing. You love your creatures, but with a gentle love. You treasure them, but without apprehension. You grieve for wrong, but suffer no pain. You can be angry and yet serene. Your works are varied, but your purpose is one and the same. You welcome all who come to you, though you never lost them. You are never in need, yet are glad to gain, never covetous, yet you exact a return for your gifts. We give abundantly to you so that we may deserve a reward. Yet which of us has anything that does not come from you? You repay us what we deserve, and yet you owe nothing to any. You release us from our debts, but you lose nothing thereby. You are my God, my life, my holy delight, but is this enough to say of you? Can any man say enough when he speaks of you? Yet woe betide those who are silent about you, for even those who are most gifted with speech cannot find words to describe you. Confessions number five. Who will grant me to rest content in you? To whom shall I turn for the gift of your coming into my heart and filling it to the brim so that I may forget all the wrong I have done and embrace you alone, my only source of good? Why do you mean so much to me? Help me to find words to explain. Why do I mean so much to you that you should command me to love you? And if I fail to love you, you are angry and threaten me with great sorrow, as if not to love you were not sorrow enough in itself. Have pity on me and help me, O Lord my God. Tell me why you mean so much to me. 
whisper in my heart, I am here to save you. Speak so that I may hear your words. My heart has ears ready to listen to you, Lord. Open them wide and whisper in my heart, I am here to save you. I shall hear your voice and make haste to clasp you to myself. Do not hide your face away from me, for I would gladly meet my death to see it, since not to see it would be death indeed. My soul is like a house, small for you to enter, but I pray you to enlarge it. It is in ruins, but I ask you to remake it. It contains much that you will not be pleased to see. This I know and do not hide. But who is to rid it of these things? There is no one but you to whom I can say, If I have sinned unwittingly, do you absolve me? Keep me ever, your own servant, far from pride. I trust, and trusting I find words to utter. Lord, you know that this is true. For have I not made my transgression known to you? Did you not remit the guilt of my sin? I do not wrangle with you for judgment, for you are truth itself, and I have no wish to delude myself for fear that my malice should be self-betrayed. No, I do not wrangle with you, for if you, Lord, will keep record of our iniquities, Master, who has strength to bear it. Confessions number six. But dust and ashes though I am, let me appeal to your pity, since it is to you in your mercy that I speak, not to a man who would simply laugh at me. Perhaps you too may laugh at me, but you will relent and have pity on me. For all I want to tell you, Lord, is that I do not know where I came from when I was born into this life which leads to death. Or should I say, this death which leads to life. This much is hidden from me, but although I do not remember it all myself, I know that when I came into the world, all the comforts which your mercy provides were there, ready for me. This I was told by my parents, the father who begat me and the mother who conceived me, the two from whose bodies you formed me in the limits of time. So it was that I was given the comfort of woman's milk. But neither my mother nor my nurses filled their breasts of their own accord, for it was you who used them, as your law prescribes, to give me infants' food and a share of the riches which you distribute even among the very humblest of all created things. It was also by your gift that I did not wish for more than you gave, and that my nurses gladly passed on to me what you gave to them. They did this because they loved me in the way that you had ordained, and their love made them anxious to give to me what they had received in plenty from you. For it was to their own good that what was good for me should come to me from them, though of course it did not come to me from them, but through them, from you. Because you, my God, are the source of all good, and everywhere you preserve me. All this I have learned since then, because all the gifts you have given to me, both spiritual and material, proclaim the truth of it. But in those days, all I knew was how to suck and how to lie still when my body sensed comfort or cry when it felt pain. Later on, I began to smile as well, first in my sleep and then when I was awake. Others told me this about myself and I believe what they said because we see other babies do the same, but I cannot remember it myself. Little by little, I began to realize where I was and to want to make my wishes known to others who might satisfy them. But this I could not do because my wishes were inside me while other people were outside and they had no faculty which could penetrate my mind. So I would toss my arms and legs about and make noises, hoping that such few signs as I could make would show my meaning, though they were quite unlike what they were meant to mine. And if my wishes were not carried out, either because they had not been understood or because what I wanted would have harmed me, I would get cross with my elders who were not at my beck and call and with people who were not my servants simply because they did not attend to my wishes. 
and I would take my revenge by bursting into tears. By watching babies, I have learnt that this is how they behave and they quite unconsciously have done more than those who brought me up and knew all about it to convince me that I behaved in just the same way myself. My infancy is long since dead, yet I am still alive. But you, Lord, live forever, and nothing in you dies, because you have existed from before the very beginning of the ages, before anything that could be set to go before, and you are God, and Lord of all you have created. In you are the first causes of all things not eternal, the unchangeable origins of all things that suffer change, the everlasting reason of all things that are subject to the passage of time and have no reason in themselves. Have pity then on me, O God, for it is pity that I need. Answer my prayer and tell me whether my infancy followed upon some other stage of life that died before it. Was it the stage of life that I spent in my mother's womb? For I've learned a little about that too, and I have myself seen women who were pregnant. But what came before that, O oh God, my delight? Was I anywhere? Was I anybody? These are questions I must put to you, for I have no one else to answer them. Neither my father nor my mother could tell me, nor could I find out from the experience of other people or from my own memory. Do my questions provoke you to smile at me and bid me simply to acknowledge you and praise you for what I do know? I do acknowledge you, Lord of heaven and earth, and I praise you for my first beginnings, although I cannot remember them. But you have allowed men to discover these things about themselves by watching other babies and also to learn much from what women have to tell. I know that I was a living person even at that age, and as I came towards the end of infancy, I tried to find signs to convey my feelings to others. Where could such a living creature come from, if not from you, O oh Lord? Can it be that any man has skill to fabricate himself? Or can there be some channel by which we derive our life and our very existence from some other source than you? Surely we can only derive them from our Maker, from you, Lord, to whom living and being are not different things, since infinite life and infinite being are one and the same. For you are infinite and never change. In you, today never comes to an end, and yet our today does come to an end in you, because time, as well as everything else, exists in you. If it did not, it would have no means of passing. And since your years never come to an end, for you they are simply today. The countless days of our lives and of our forefathers' lives have passed by within your today. From it they have received their due measure of duration and their very existence. And so it will be with all the other days which are still to come. But you yourself are eternally the same. In your today, you will make all that is to exist tomorrow and thereafter. And in your today, you have made all that existed yesterday and forever before. Need it concern me if some people cannot understand this. Let them ask what it means and be glad to ask. But they may content themselves with the question alone. For it is better for them to find you and leave the question unanswered than to find the answer without finding you. Confessions number seven. Hear me, O God, how wicked are the sins of men. Men say this and you pity them because you made man but you did not make sin in him. Who can recall to me the sins I committed as a baby? For in your sight, no man is free from sin, not even the child who has lived only one day on earth. Who can show me what my sins were? Some small baby in whom I can see all that I do not remember about myself. 
What sins then did I commit when I was a baby myself? Was it a sin to cry when I wanted to feed at the breast? I am too old now to feed on mother's milk, but if I were to cry for the kind of food suited to my age, others would rightly laugh me to scorn and remonstrate with me. So then, too, I deserved the scolding for what I did. But since I could not have understood the scolding, it would have been unreasonable and most unusual to rebuke me. We root out these faults and discard them as we grow up, and this is proof enough that they are faults, because I have never seen a man purposely throw out the good when he clears away the bad. It can hardly be right for a child, even at that age, to cry for everything, including things which would harm him. To work himself into a tantrum against people older than himself and not required to obey him, and to try his best to strike and hurt others who know better than he does, including his own parents, when they do not give in to him and refuse to pander to whims which would only do him harm. This shows that if babies are innocent, it is not for lack of will to do harm, but for lack of strength. I have myself seen jealousy in a baby and know what it means. He was not old enough to talk, but whenever he saw his foster brother at the breast, he would grow pale with envy. This much is common knowledge. Mothers and nurses say that they can work such things out of the system by one means or another, but surely it cannot be called innocence when the milk flows in such abundance from its source to object to a rival desperately in need and depending for his life on this one form of nourishment. Such faults are not small or unimportant, but we are tender-hearted and bear with them because we know that the child will grow out of them. It is clear that they are not mere peccadillos, because the same faults are intolerable in older persons. You, O oh Lord my God, gave me my life and my body when I was born. You gave my body its five senses. You furnished it with limbs and gave it its proper proportions and you implanted in it all the instincts necessary for the welfare and safety of a living creature. For these gifts you command me to acknowledge you and praise you and sing in honour of your name, because you are almighty God, because you are good, and because I owe you praise for these things, even if you had done nothing else. No one but you can do these things, because you are the one and only mould in which all things are cast, and the perfect form which shapes all things, and everything takes its place according to your law. I do not remember that early part of my life, O oh Lord, but I believe what other people have told me about it, and from watching other babies I can conclude that I also lived as they do. But. True though my conclusions may be, I do not like to think of that period as part of the same life I now lead, because it is dim and forgotten, and in this sense, it is no different from the time I spent in my mother's womb. But if I was born in sin, and guilt was with me already when my mother conceived me, where, I ask you, Lord, where or when was I, your servant, ever innocent? But I will say no more about that time, for since no trace of it remains in my memory, it need no longer concern me. Confessions 8 The next stage in my life as I grew up was boyhood. Or would it be truer to say that boyhood overtook me and followed upon my infancy? Not that my infancy left me, for if it did, where did it go? All the same, it was no longer there, because I ceased to be a baby unable to talk, and was now a boy with the power of speech. I can remember that time, and later on I realised how I had learned to speak. 
It was not my elders who showed me the words by some set system of instruction in the way that they taught me to read not long afterwards. But instead, I taught myself by using the intelligence which you, my God, gave to me. For when I tried to express my meaning by crying out and making various sounds and movements so that my wishes should be obeyed, I found that I could not convey all that I meant or make myself understood by everyone whom I wished to understand me. So my memory prompted me. I noticed that people would name some object and then turn towards whatever it was that they had named. I watched them and understood that the sound they made when they wanted to indicate the particular thing was the name which they gave to it. And their actions clearly showed what they meant, for there is a kind of universal language consisting of expressions of the face and eyes, gestures and tones of voice, which can show whether a person means to ask for something and get it, or refuse it and have nothing to do with it. So by hearing words arranged in various phrases and constantly repeated, I gradually pieced together what they stood for. And when my tongue had mastered the pronunciation, I began to express my wishes by means of them. In this way, I made my wants known to my family and they made theirs known to me. And I took a further step into the stormy life of human society. Although I was still subject to the authority of my parents and the will of my elders. Confessions 9 But, O oh God, my God, I now went through a period of suffering and humiliation. I was told that it was right and proper for me as a boy to pay attention to my teachers so that I should do well at my study of grammar and get on in the world. This was the way to gain the respect of others and win for myself what passes for wealth in this world. So I was sent to school to learn to read. I was too small to understand what purpose it might serve and yet, if I was idle at my studies, I was beaten for it because beating was favoured by tradition. Countless boys long since forgotten had built up this stony path for us to tread and we were made to pass along it, adding to the toil and sorrow of the sons of Adam. But we found that some men prayed to you, Lord, and we learned from them to do the same, thinking of you in the only way that we could understand, as some great person who could listen to us and help us, even though we could not see you or hear you or touch you. I was still a boy when I first began to pray to you, my help and my refuge. I used to prattle away to you, and though I was small, my devotion was great when I begged you not to let me be beaten at school. Sometimes, for my own good, you did not grant my prayer, and then my elders and even my parents, who certainly wished me no harm, would laugh at the beating I got. And in those days, beatings were my one great bugbear. O oh Lord, throughout the world men beseech you, to preserve them from the rack and the hook and various similar tortures which terrify them. Some people are merely callous, but if a man clings to you with great devotion, how can his piety inspire him to find it in his heart to make light of these tortures when he loves those who dread them so fearfully? And yet this was how our parents scoffed at the torments which we boys suffered at the hands of our masters. For we feared the whip just as much as others fear the rack, and we, no less than they, begged you to preserve us from it. But we sinned by reading and writing and studying less than was expected of us. We lacked neither memory nor intelligence, because by your will, O Lord, we had as much of both as was sufficient for our years. 
but we enjoyed playing games and were punished for them by men who played games themselves. However, grown-up games are known as business, and even though boys' games are much the same, they are punished for them by their elders. No one pities either the boys or the men, though surely we deserved pity. For I cannot believe that a good judge would approve of the beatings I received as a boy, on the ground that my games delayed my progress in studying subjects which would enable me to play a less creditable game later in life. Was the master who beat me himself very different from me? If he were worsted by a colleague in some petty argument, he would be convulsed with anger and envy, much more so than I was when a playmate beat me at a game of ball. Confessions 10 And yet I sinned, O Lord my God, creator and arbiter of all natural things, but arbiter only, not creator, of sin. I sinned, O Lord, by disobeying my parents and the masters of whom I have spoken. For whatever purpose they had in mind, later on I might have put to good use all the things which they wanted me to learn. I was disobedient, not because I chose something better than they proposed to me, but simply from the love of games. For I liked to score a fine win at sport, or to have my ears tickled by the make-believe of the stage, which only made them itch the more. As time went on, my eyes shone more and more with the same eager curiosity, because I wanted to see the shows and sports which grown-ups enjoyed. The patrons who pay for the production of these shows are held in esteem such as most parents would wish for their children. Yet the same parents willingly allow their children to be flogged if they are distracted by these displays from the studies which are supposed to fit them to grow rich and give the same sort of shows themselves. Look on these things with pity, O Lord and free us who now call upon you from such delusions. Set free also those who have not yet called upon you, so that they may pray to you and you may free them from this folly. Confessions 11 while still a boy, I had been told of the eternal life promised to us by our Lord, who humbled himself and came down amongst us proud sinners. As a catechumen, I was blessed regularly from birth with the sign of the cross and was seasoned with God's salt. For our Lord, my mother placed great hope in you. Once as a child, I was taken suddenly ill with the disorder of the stomach and was on the point of death. You, my God, were my guardian even then, and you saw the fervour and strength of my faith as I appealed to the piety of my own mother and to the mother of us all, your church, to give me the baptism of Christ, your son, who is my God and my master. My earthly mother was deeply anxious because in the pure faith of her heart, she was in greater labour to ensure my eternal salvation than she had been at my birth. Had I not quickly recovered, she would have hastened to see that I was admitted to the sacraments of salvation and washed clean by acknowledging you, Lord Jesus, for the pardon of my sins. So my washing in the waters of baptism was postponed in the surmise that if I continued to live, I should defile myself again with sin, and after baptism the guilt of pollution would be greater and more dangerous. Even at that age, I already believed in you, and so did my mother and the whole household except for my father. But in my heart, 
He did not gain the better of my mother's piety and prevent me from believing in Christ just because he still disbelieved himself. For she did all that she could to see that you, my God, should be a father to me rather than he. In this, you helped her to turn the scales against her husband, whom she always obeyed, because by obeying him, she obeyed your law, thereby showing greater virtue than he did. I ask you, my God, for if it is your will, I long to know, for what purpose was my baptism postponed at that time? Was it for my good that the reins which held me from sin were slackened? Or is it untrue that they were slackened? If not, why do we continually hear people say, even nowadays, leave him alone and let him do it? He is not yet baptised. Yet when the health of the body is at stake, no one says, let him get worse. He is not yet cured. It would then have been much better if I had been healed at once. And if all that I and my family could do had been done to make sure that once my soul had received its salvation, its safety should be left in your keeping since its salvation had come from you. This would surely have been the better course. But my mother well knew how many great tides of temptation threatened me before I grew up, and she chose to let them beat upon the as yet unmoulded clay rather than upon the finished image which had received the stamp of baptism. Confessions 12 These temptations were thought to be less of a danger in boyhood than in adolescence. But even as a boy, I did not care for lessons and I disliked being forced to study. All the same, I was compelled to learn and good came to me as a result, although it was not of my own making. For I would not have studied at all if I had not been obliged to do so. And what a person does against his will is not to his own credit, even if what he does is good in itself. Nor was the good which came of it due to those who compelled me to study, but to you, my God. For they had not the insight to see that I might put the lessons which they forced me to learn to any other purpose than the satisfaction of man's insatiable desire for the poverty he calls wealth and the infamy he knows as fame. But you, who take every hair of our heads into your reckoning, used for my benefit the mistaken ideas of all those who insisted on making me study, and you used the mistake I made myself in not wishing to study as a punishment which I deserved to pay, for I was a great sinner for so small a boy. In this way, you turned their faults to my advantage and justly punished me for my own. For this is what you have ordained, and so it is with us, that every soul that sins brings its own punishment upon itself. Confessions 13 Even now, I cannot fully understand why the Greek language, which I learned as a child, was so distasteful to me. I loved Latin, not the elementary lessons, but those which I studied later on the teachers of literature. The first lessons in Latin were reading, writing and counting and they were as much of an irksome imposition as any studies in Greek. But this too was due to the sinfulness and vanity of life, 
Since I was flesh and blood, no better than a breath of wind that passes by and never returns. For these elementary lessons were far more valuable than those which followed, because the subjects were practical. They gave me the power, which I still have, of reading whatever is set before me and writing whatever I wish to write. But in the later lessons, I was obliged to memorize the wanderings of a hero named Aeneas, while in the meantime I failed to remember my own erratic ways. I learned to lament the death of Dido, who killed herself for love, while all the time in the midst of these things I was dying, separated from you, my God and my life and I shed no tears for my own plight. What can be more pitiful than an unhappy wretch, unaware of his own sorry state, bewailing the fate of Dido, who died for love of Aeneas, yet shedding no tears for himself as he dies for want of loving you? O oh God, you are the light of my heart the bread of my inmost soul, and the power that weds my mind and the thoughts of my heart. But I did not love you. I broke my troth with you and embraced another while applause echoed about me. For to love this world is to break troth with you, yet men applaud and are ashamed to be otherwise. I did not weep over this, but instead I wept for Dido, who surrendered her life to the sword, while I forsook you and surrendered myself to the lowest of your created things. And if I were forbidden to read these books, I was sad not to be able to read the very things that made me sad. Such folly is held to be a higher and more fruitful form of study than learning to read and write. But now, my God, let your voice ring in my soul and let your truth proclaim to me that it is wrong to think this. Tell me that reading and writing are by far the better study. This must be true for I would rather forget the wanderings of Aeneas and all that goes with them than how to read and write. It is true that curtains are hung over the entrances to the schools where literature is taught, but they are not so much symbols in honour of mystery as veils concealing error. The schoolmasters need not exclaim at my words, for I no longer go in fear of them now that I confess my soul's desires to you, my God, and gladly blame myself for my evil ways so that I may enjoy the good ways you have shown me. Neither those who traffic in literature nor those who buy their wares need exclaim against me. For if I put to them the question whether it is true, as the poet says, that Aeneas once came to Carthage, the less learned will plead ignorance and the better informed will admit that it is not true. But if I ask how the name of Aeneas is spelt, anyone who has learned to read will give me the right answer, based on the agreed convention which fixes the alphabet for all of us. If I next ask them whether a man would lose more by forgetting how to read and write or by forgetting the fancies dreamed up by the poets, surely everyone who is not out of his wits can see the answer they would give. So it was wrong of me as a boy to prefer empty romances to more valuable studies. In fact, it would be truer to say that I loved the one and hated the other. But in those days, 
One and one are two, two and two are four, was a loathsome jingle. While the wooden horse and its crew of soldiers, the burning of Troy and even the ghost of Creusa made a most enchanting dream, futile though it was. Confessions 14 If this was so, why did I dislike Greek literature, which tells these tales as much as the Greek language itself? Homer, as well as Virgil, was a skillful spinner of yarns and he is most delightfully imaginative. Nevertheless, as a boy, I found him little to my taste. I suppose that Greek boys think the same about Virgil when they are forced to study him as I was forced to study Homer. There was of course the difficulty which is found in learning any foreign language, and this soured the sweetness of the Greek romances. For I understood not a single word, and I was constantly subjected to violent threats and cruel punishments to make me learn. As a baby, of course, I knew no Latin either, but I learned it without fear and fret, simply by keeping my ears open while my nurses fondled me and everyone laughed and played happily with me. I learned it without being forced by threats of punishment because it was my own wish to be able to give expression to my thoughts. I could never have done this if I had not learned a few words, not from schoolmasters, but from people who spoke to me and listened when I delivered to their ears whatever thoughts I had conceived. This clearly shows that we learn better in a free spirit of curiosity than under fear and compulsion. But your law, O oh God, permits the free flow of curiosity to be stemmed by force. From the schoolmaster's cane to the ordeals of martyrdom, your law prescribes bitter medicine to retrieve us from the noxious pleasures which cause us to desert you. Confessions 15 Grant my prayer, O Lord, and do not allow my soul to wilt under the discipline which you prescribe. Let me not tire of thanking you for your mercy in rescuing me from all my wicked ways, so that you may be sweeter to me than all the joys which used to tempt me, so that I may love you most intensely, and clasp your hand with all the power of my devotion, so that you may save me from all temptation until the end of my days. You, O oh Lord, are my King and my God, and in your service I want to use whatever good I learned as a boy. I can speak and write, read and count, and I want these things to be used to serve you. Because when I studied other subjects, you checked me and forgave me the sins I committed by taking pleasure in such worthless things. It is true that these studies taught me many useful words, but the same words can be learnt by studying something that matters. And this is the safe course for a boy to follow. Confessions 16 But we are carried away by custom to our own undoing 
and it is hard to struggle against the stream. Will this torrent never dry up? How much longer will it sweep the sons of Adam down to that vast and terrible sea which cannot easily be passed, even by those who climb upon the Ark of the Cross? This traditional education taught me that Jupiter punishes the wicked with his thunderbolts and yet commits adultery himself. The two roles are quite incompatible. All the same, he is represented in this way, and the result is that those who follow his example in adultery can put a bold face on it by making false pretenses of thunder. But can any schoolmaster in his gown listen unperturbed to a man who challenges him on his own ground and says, Homer invented these stories and attributed human sins to the gods. He would have done better to provide men with examples of divine goodness. It would be nearer the truth to say that Homer certainly invented the tales, but peopled them with wicked human characters in the guise of gods. In this way, their wickedness would not be reckoned a crime and all who did as they did could be shown to follow the example of the heavenly gods, not that of sinful mortals. And yet human children are pitched into this hellish torrent, together with the fees which are paid to have them taught lessons like these. Much business is at stake too, when these matters are publicly debated because the law decrees that teachers should be paid a salary in addition to the fees paid by their pupils. And the roar of the torrent beating upon its boulders seems to say, this is the school where men are made masters of words. This is where they learn the art of persuasion, so necessary in business and debate. As much as to say that but for a certain passage in Terence, we should never have heard of words like shower, golden, lap, deception, sky, and the other words which occur in the same scene. Terence brings on to the stage a dissolute youth who excuses his own fornication by pointing to the example of Jupiter. He looks at a picture painted on the wall, which shows how Jupiter is said to have deceived the girl, Danae, by raining a golden shower into her lap. These are the words with which he incites himself to lechery, as though he had heavenly authority for it. What a god he is, his mighty thunder rocks the sky from end to end. You may say that I am only a man and thundering is beyond my power, but I played the rest of the part well enough, and willingly too. The words are certainly not learnt any the more easily by reason of the filthy moral, but filth is committed with greater confidence as a result of learning the words. I have nothing against the words themselves, they are like choice and costly glasses, but they contain the wine of error which had already gone to the heads of the teachers who poured it out for us to drink. If we refused to drink, we were beaten for it without the right to appeal to a sober judge. With your eyes upon me, my God, my memory can safely recall those days but it is true that I learned all these things gladly and took a sinful pleasure in them. And for this very reason, I was called a promising boy. Confessions 17 
Let me tell you, my God, how I squandered the brains you gave me on foolish delusions. I was set a task which troubled me greatly, for if I were successful, I might win some praise. If not, I was afraid of disgrace or a beating. I had to recite the speech of Juno, who was pained and angry because she could not prevent Aeneas from sailing to Italy. I had been told that Juno had never really spoken the words, but we were compelled to make believe and follow the flight of the poet's fancy by repeating in prose what he had said in verse. The contest was to be won by the boy who found the best words to suit the meaning and best expressed feelings of sorrow and anger appropriate to the majesty of the character he impersonated. What did all this matter to me, my God, my true life? Why did my recitation win more praise than those of the many other boys in my class? Surely it was all so much smoke without fire. Was there no other subject on which I might have sharpened my wits and my tongue? I might have used them, O oh Lord, to praise you in the words of your scriptures, which could have been a prop to support my heart, as if it were a young vine, so that it would not have produced this crop of worthless fruit, fit only for the birds to peck at. For offerings can be made to those birds of prey, the fallen angels, in more ways than one. Confessions 18 But was it surprising that I was lured into these fruitless pastimes and wandered away from you, my God? I was expected to model myself upon men who were disconcerted by the rebukes they received if they used outlandish words or strange idioms to tell of some quite harmless thing they might have done but reveled in the applause they earned for the fine flow of well-ordered and nicely balanced phrases with which they described their own acts of indecency. You see all things, Lord, and yet you keep silence, because you are patient and full of compassion and can tell no lie. Will you be silent forever? This very day, you are ready to rescue from this fearsome abyss any soul that searches for you, any man who says from the depths of his heart, I have eyes only for you. I long, Lord, for your presence. For the soul that is blinded by wicked passions is far from you and cannot see your face. The path that leads us away from you and brings us back again is not measured by footsteps or milestones. The prodigal son of the scriptures went to live in a distant land to waste in dissipation all the wealth which his father had given him when he set out. But to reach that land, he did not hire horses, carriages or ships. He did not take to the air on real wings or set one foot before the other for you are the father who gave him riches. You loved him when he set out, and you loved him still more when he came home without a penny. But he set his heart on pleasure, and his soul was blinded, and this blindness was the measure of the distance he travelled away from you, so that he could not see your face. O oh Lord, my God, be patient as you always are, with the men of this world as you watch them, and see how strictly they obey the rules of grammar which have been handed down to them, and yet ignore the eternal rules of everlasting salvation which they have received from you. A man who has learned the traditional rules of pronunciation, 
or teaches them to others, gives greater scandal if he breaks them by dropping the H from human being than if he breaks your rules and hates another human, his fellow man. This is just as perverse as to imagine that our enemies can do us more harm than we do to ourselves by hating them, or that by persecuting another man we can damage him more fatally than we damage our own hearts in the process. O oh God, alone in majesty, high in the silence of heaven, unseen by man, we can see how your unremitting justice punishes unlawful ambition with blindness. For a man who longs for fame as a fine speaker will stand up before a human judge, surrounded by a human audience, and lash his opponent with malicious invective, taking the greatest care not to say human instead of human by a slip of the tongue. And yet the thought that the frenzy in his own mind may condemn a human being to death, disturbs him not at all. Confessions 19 It was at the threshold of a world such as this that I stood in peril as a boy. I was already being prepared for its tournaments by a training which taught me to have a horror of faulty grammar instead of teaching me when I committed these faults not to envy others who avoided them. All this, my God, I admit and confess to you. By these means I won praise from the people whose favour I sought for I thought that the right way to live was to do as they wished. I was blind to the whirlpool of debasement in which I had been plunged away from the sight of your eyes. For in your eyes, nothing could be more debased than I was then, since I was even troublesome to the people whom I set out to please. Many and many a time, I lied to my tutor, my masters, and my parents, and deceived them because I wanted to play games or watch some futile show, or was impatient to imitate what I saw on the stage. I even stole from my parents' larder and from their table, either from greed or to get something to give to other boys in exchange for their favourite toys, which they were willing to barter with me. And in the games I played with them, I often cheated in order to come off the better, simply because a vain desire to win had got the better of me. And yet, there was nothing I could less easily endure, nothing that made me quarrel more bitterly than to find others cheating me as I cheated them. All the same, if they found me out and blamed me for it, I would lose my temper rather than give in. Can this be the innocence of childhood? Far from it, O oh Lord. But I beg you to forgive it. For commanders and kings may take the place of tutors and schoolmasters. Knots and bulls and pet birds may give way to money and estates and servants. But these same passions remain with us while one stage of life follows upon another, just as more severe punishments follow upon the schoolmaster's cane. It was, then, simply because they are small that you used children to symbolise humility, when as our king you commended it by saying that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Confessions 20 And yet, Lord, even if you had willed that I should not survive my childhood, I should have owed you gratitude, because you are our God, the supreme good, the creator and ruler of the universe. 
for even as a child I existed, I was alive, I had the power of feeling, I had an instinct to keep myself safe and sound, to preserve my own being, which was a trace of the single unseen being from whom it was derived. I had an inner sense which watched over my bodily senses and kept them in full vigour. And even in the small things which occupied my thoughts, I found pleasure in the truth. I disliked finding myself in the wrong. My memory was good. I was acquiring the command of words. I enjoyed the company of friends. And I shrank from pain, ignorance and sorrow. Should I not be grateful that so small a creature possessed such wonderful qualities? But they were all gifts from God, for I did not give them to myself. His gifts are good, and the sum of them all is my own self. Therefore, the God who made me must be good, and all the good in me is his. I thank him and praise him for all the good in my life, even my life as a boy. But my sin was this, that I looked for pleasure, beauty, and truth not in him, but in myself and his other creatures. And the search led me instead to pain, confusion, and error. My God, in whom is my delight, my glory, and my trust, I thank you for your gifts and beg you to preserve and keep them from me. Keep me too, and so your gifts will grow and reach perfection, and I shall be with you myself, for I should not even exist if it were not by your gift.